who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here where we serve a still speaking God. This is a place of extravagant welcome. If you call God he, she, or spirit, you're welcome here. If you're old in years but young in heart, you are welcome here. If you're an old soul in a young body, you're welcome here. If you need a community to embrace your children, you are welcome here. If you need to be forgiven, or if you need to forgive someone else, you are welcome here. This is the place where we reject racism, where we fight injustice, and we share our earthly and spiritual resources. This morning, I am wearing a hajib because I wanted to stand in solidarity with the other children of Abraham. For Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad were all direct descendants of Abraham. So this morning, we stand in solidarity with them at this horrific time of loss. This is the place where we pray out loud and in silence. We love old hymns, we love classical music and gospel. We welcome those who are gay, straight, bisexual, transgender, or questioning. We embrace diversity. And we love God. And guess what? We are so glad that you are here. So let us just take a breath in and a breath out. One more time for the rush of the morning may still cling to us. Again, let us breathe in and let us breathe out. Let us worship the Lord. Good morning, Pilgrim. Good morning. Thank you now for letting me good morning to you all. 
Um, first off, thank you so very much, Reverend Michelle Hughes. This woman has known me as far as I could remember speaking about the sermon call to ministry. So that was over 17 years ago. And so I want to thank her publicly for not only what she does, but who she is, how beautiful of a human being she is, how true to God's calling that she is, and how kind and also just a little bit quirky she is. <laughs> Um, also, a point of um, pastoral privilege I'm going to take real quick. So that whole second row right there, ain't nothing like family. So these are, um, from left to right, Robin Beeman, Claudette Roper, Cheryl Curry, my mother, Janice McCullough, Adrian, our cousin, and my very dear friend, Reverend Annette Banks. These women, you need to know, if they had not been, I know we talk about if it had not been for the Lord, but if it had not been for these women, at my front, at my back, and on each side, at all times, I assure you that I would not be here. So I am very thankful for each and every one of you all for being God's stewards of the good gift that God has placed in me. Thank you for helping me to bring that forward. Amen. Won't you pray with me? God of all things, God of creation, God of light, and God who is not afraid of the darkness. God who brings forth life and God who is there even in death times. We thank you for this morning's rising. We thank you for the clarity of being able to breathe and know that it is indeed you who has brought us into this day. We thank you that last night was not our last and that this morning is a new mercy. And out of that gratitude, God, we bow our heads and lift our hands and say thank you today. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for giving us another shot at getting it right, not just for you, but in this world, Lord. We are in a world that is devastating and at the same time striving for you. Help us to be your handmaidens in birthing a new vision of your world on this earth. God, we ask that you would help us to bring the kingdom to life here and now. God, we join in solidarity with the mothers and the fathers. It is not just Rachel's children who are weeping, but it is Hagar's children who are weeping today, God. It is the children, the children, the children, the children, the mothers and the fathers that we have lost. God, we stand here and we thank you for a moment to acknowledge how you keep extending yourself that we may write the wrongs of this world. Holy Spirit, fall fresh. Fall fresh on me. Make me and mold me. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Open our eyes, ears, and hearts to what it is that you have to say to us with and through one another. All of these things we ask that you receive in the name of Jesus, amen. amen. So we read 107, the first three verses, which are the ones that we tend to enjoy out of this psalm. And I called a good friend of mine, uh, Kim Musa, who is a professor of Hebrew Bible at Christian Theological Seminary, and I had to check in with her because that's what I do. When I preach, I check in with people first. And she's a Bible expert in Hebrew Bible. And I said, Kim, and she said, well, the first thing you need to know, that's a long song. What part are you talking about? <laughs> so we only read the first three verses. But I do want us to be mindful of the rest of the song. In particular, I want us to focus on verses 23 through 32. And I'll read them for you in your hearing. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the mighty waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, God's wondrous works, in the deep. 
For God commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their calamity. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And God brought them out of their distress. God made the storm be still. And the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet. And God brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for God's steadfast love, for God's wonderful works to humankind. Let them extol God in the congregation of the people and praise in the assembly of the elders. Praise. Praise is what we do. We were created to worship God. I would like to submit to you that praise also has a partner called life. All of life is not something that makes us want to say, oh, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> when you get home a little later on, I encourage you to go and read those verses that I skipped over, I spared you, <laughs> between 3 and 23. Go back and read, because this praise, though it starts out, the song starts out with praise, and it ends with praise, there's a lot going on in between there. Right? In between verses 3 and 23, there are stories of people who are hungry and who are praising God because they are no longer hungry. There are people who have found their way back to the people of God, to the temple. They are glad to be home. They are, they are praising because they are home. And, and so a lot of the praise that happens in this text is born out of trouble. But the story that's happening, the piece that's here in 323, it's not about people who are praising because they did something and they're in trouble. They're praising because they were going about the business on the waters, the deep waters, and thus the trouble came for them while they were out doing their business. So I would say that this text in its entirety is not for the novice. This praise that comes out of this text is not a beginner's praise, shall we say. No, this song is for what I call the grown folks of faith. Grown folks. While most of us would like to focus on the three verses that started, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good, for God's love, for that steadfast love endures forever. The rest of the text, the song in its entirety, is about the matters of life that precede the thanks. I, too, enjoy this intro, just like so many others that we even heard by Reverend Shelby begin with, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Or another, I was glad when they said unto me, Come, let us go into the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up that the everlasting God will come in. Praise. Who doesn't get excited? I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. Because my help comes from the Lord. If you've got even just a moment, an ounce of gratitude, it only takes just a little bit of an admonishment to praise God for God being God's self. It makes sense. And it makes sense only because of the parts that we don't sing out loud. The parts that give your praise some substance. Right? Meanwhile, footnote, I do want to stop to acknowledge that the fact that God is is enough for us to praise God. But I do want to tiptoe on back into the part where if you've ever been through some things, and if you can make it to the other side of the thing, you can't wait to thank God for coming through. Right? Substance, substantive praise. I want to go further this morning and talk about that kind of praise that raises up from somewhere between the pit of your stomach and the cavern in your heart, that space right in here raises up from a place of power about the truth that God is with you even as the you are in what we could even identify as the pit of hell. Now you know that's some kind of praise when you praise it in the middle of going through, the middle of being ill, the middle of loss, the middle of not knowing. Yet and still, there is something on the inside that refutes what's on the outside. And what do you do? You say, thank you, God. Not for the trouble. Let me be real clear about that, because I'm not one to be like, oh, thank you for the trouble. No, thank you that I'm not alone. Thank you that you are a sustainer and that you are a keeper even in the face of death. You are with me, so I don't have to be afraid. Thank you, God. In the middle 
of hell. There's a way in which the presence of God illuminates a fire within us. Shines a light in the middle of the darkness where we cannot see, where it's hot, where it's tiresome, where there is, it seems relentless. There is a place where God shows up and keeps us moving, right? And what's interesting is that this text, it says that there were some who went down into the deep waters, right? And, and so this notion of praise that burns like fire but yet is born underwater. When the oceans of life come, nearly taking you over, there's a way in which this psalmist reminds us to praise in the middle of it a fire that's burning and created and keeps fanning underwater. And I must say that in the spirit of song, just like the psalmist, I too have a song. It reminded me of a song that came out a few years ago by Adele. Y'all, anybody listen to Adele? Yeah. I was going to do the Addison Brothers, but I can probably back to Adele. <laughs> And back in the day, she said, there's a fire starting in my heart, reaching a fever pitch, and it's bringing me out the dark. Finally, I can see you crystal clear. Go ahead and sell me out, and I'll lay your ship bare. See how I leave with every piece of you. Don't underestimate the things that I will do. There's a fire starting in my heart, reaching a fever pitch, and it's bringing me out the dark. And then she says, we couldn't have it. We could have had it all rolling in it, as if to say, if it just hadn't been for this trouble, we could have had it all. But there it is, rolling in the deep is where she has found the power of her song. Rolling in the deep. The song is a powerful mix of proclamation and passion about what it means to live and to love and to keep going when things are hard. I take this song as the jump off for talking about what it means to go rolling in the deep matters of faith. Rolling in the deep matters of faith. First of all, verse 29 gets down to the piece where it says, Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the mighty waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. First of all, God is not interested in the safety of the shore. Some of God's best work takes us out into the deep, calls us into the deep. More often than not, we want to identify having to be saved from the waters to suggest that we shouldn't have been in the water in the first place. There was something that we did that brought this mighty storm upon us. But I would suggest to you that these sailors here in, 25, in verse 25 said, no, my business is out in the deep water. Our business as children of God is in the deep water of life. Deep water, New Zealand, 100 plus people killed while trying to worship their God. Deep water, Christians ought not be silent. As our sister is here, they don't need to be job in solidarity. Deep water, deep water, deep water. What is your calling of life and where does it call you to go? Deep water, Let, what, what does it mean? To understand, because you have to remember that the sailors were the ones who were the ones who went out and fished for the community back at home. How does your sense of calling send you out deep so that you can then come back and benefit the community? We live in an individual, a hyper individualized society that says, I got mine, I hope you get yours too, <laughs> with no sense of the I being connected to the we. That is not what is happening here in this text. It is the sailors, everybody else, people been, people are glad to be in the temple. They say, we're not going anywhere. We've been hungry. We're going to stay in this temple. This is the previous verses. We're going to stay here and get fed. There are people who have been lost, didn't know God. They were like, we've been out there. We are not going anywhere. We're going to stay here in this temple. But in 25, it is the sailors, the merchants, who know that the livelihood of the community relies upon them being willing to go out into the tempest. What has God placed in your heart as your gift to community? And how are you letting it guide you in your daily living? How are you letting it guide you to interrupt the status quo? How are you letting it guide you to speak up 
when silence is wreaking havoc, violence, pain, and inhumanity. This is the work that calls us into the deep, right? And what's interesting, the interesting piece about it is that there are some things you cannot do on the shore. It's not enough just to know what your work is. You got to go be willing to follow where your work calls you. And, and one of the important pieces about this is that when it gets rough, because then in the next few verses down it says that the sea, the ocean, raised up. Right? Raised up, raised, God raised the winds and the water that he had called them to get into. There is nothing really that can prepare a person of faith for having to reckon with the reality that the same God who saves life, who brings forth life, is also the same God who does indeed stir up the ocean of life. There is nothing that can really prepare us for recognizing that the same God who's been so good, been so good, and I love God. That that same God is the one who is the author and the finisher, not only of your faith, but also life. There is nothing like that moment when you are out there doing the work of God, trying to be a good Christian, trying to love the Lord, speaking up for what's right, extending compassion, opening arms of grace, beholding one another with the love of Christ only to recognize that that same God did not stop the betrayal. That same God did not stop the disappointment. Yet it is the same God who helps us learn how to ride the, wide, the waves of our faith riding high and learning how to tuck when it's time to go low. Growing up in our faith, requires that we learn how to be able to be nimble when the water starts moving. You gotta be able to bob and move. You gotta have some flexibility in your faith, right? You gotta be willing to say, I heard God speaking over here in this particular time in this way, but wait, no, God is doing something else. And I need to follow the voice of God in this way, lest I be overwhelmed by the ways of life. You gotta learn how to ride the highs that God is bringing you to and tuck and roll for the low of faith, right? And that reminds me that just because it's deep does not mean that it is dead. <laughs> For there are surely moments where you have decided, surely this will be the end of me. Surely this will be my undoing. Surely, I know it's hitting the other song, surely, Grace, I understand that, but on the water, so surely this has got to be the end of me. But the same God who stirs up the tempest, teaches you how to rock and roll in the depths, and you do not drown. The same God is willing to hear you at that last breath. Because the text says, then they cried out. Then, when it was rough. Right, so and I want you to say, because I started out with this text is not for novices. Let's just be very clear. There is no shame in being a seasoned saint and still saying, I don't know. Help me today, Jesus. <laughs> then, don't ever think that you've been walking with the Lord for so long that you just got this. <laughs> you're going to handle it on your own. Then they cried out, Lord, I did my best with the skills you gave me, but it's getting tight up here. It's not working. It ain't moving, Lord. Then they cried out. And then God shows God's face. It wasn't that God had been there the whole time. It's simply that God showed God's face and God's desire to say, all right, I got it. You've had enough. Is anybody else grateful for those little ports in the storm? <laughs> where you, where you, I understand, I understand. We talk about never putting up on, more than on you than you can bear. Yeah, 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 I got that. <laughs> And there's some stuff, it is just simply too much. And I need a port, Lord. I need, I just, I'm taking on water. I need, I need more than one nostril above the, above the sea. <laughs> the dog paddle is not, I just need a little more. 
And then all of a sudden you find God raising you up. It's time to ride the high. <laughs> Going in deep also teaches you learn how to learn how to breathe. You've got to learn how to take full advantage of the high when you're right when you're riding the top of the way. Breathe deeply. Don't fear breathing at the top of the way, thinking you got to grab as much air because it meant just breathe easy and and trust that as God brings the water down to level and maybe back down low and deep that you have enough air. Trust the highs and believe in the possibilities of the lows. The final piece in here that I love about this, God's business takes us out into the deep. Deep does not mean dead. The final piece here is that your praise is not just for you. It's not even, I would say, I might get in trouble for this, it's not even just for God. Your praise is for the people you going back to to tell about where you've been. So be not ashamed of where you've been. Sometimes we want to do that shame thing if it's hard, if you have a moment where you're, you're not clear, you're questioning God, you're mad at God, and, and people want to, you know, do a, do a thing. Your faith ought to be strong enough. You ought not. Sometimes, the most powerful praise only comes through the most difficult times. And when you come through on the other side, come back in and tell everybody about it. Because maybe the congregation needs to be realigned about your stories about being out there coming to and from. Right? Because the text says it told them to go back to the congregation and go back in the presence of the elders. It didn't say keep going and tell the father. That might have been another song. That's another text. But this was said, come back in here, break protocol, right? Because usually maybe it was supposed to be the priest that was supposed to be lifting up the prayer. But break protocol. Get so, anybody ever get so excited that you came through that you don't care what the protocol, you don't care about the politics of respectability? You don't care. You just happy you made it through. You know, you can't sit there. You know, you're trying to sit there and then you wait for the praise and worship moment. <laughs> you're waiting for the, the moment on the agenda. It's time to get the praise report. <laughs> and you're just sitting there because, ooh, you just can't wait to talk about the goodness of the Lord because you learned how to swim in the deep end. You can't wait. Somebody else might be talking about, well, we're excited about the building fund. We're the, no, you want to talk about how you made it through, how God, somebody else might want to talk about, and the new parking lot, you know, the parking lot, but you know what I just been through? The parking lot. The parking lot. Do you know that God just saved my job from a ridiculous cut down situation? Do you know that I'm cancer free and in remission? Do you know? That my child that I didn't think could go to college is going on scholarship. Do you know that I had a dream and an idea and suddenly now that dream and idea has become a business that pays the majority of my bills? Do you know that I was silent because I didn't have words because of the place I've been in, the depression and the anxiety, the alcoholism, the violence, the abuse, the neglect, the deep place. But do you know that God raised up a wave and settled the tempest? Do you know that I went out to go do my work? And do you know what I found? Do you know who found me? Do you know what it is like that when the ocean came over me, all it did was give me a nice cleansing bath? Do you know that the water came at just the right time before the seasons of life almost burnt me up? Do you know what it's like to be refreshed and not overcome? The deep water. Go out and find your deep water. Come back and tell it and get excited about it. 
don't wait, break protocol, bust it in the door. <laughs> don't be afraid of what people may say about you. Be out your mind. Right? Be a fool for the who. Right? Be the one to smile in the middle of the hard times because you don't learn how to breathe and you're trying to wait to teach somebody else how to breathe. Be that one. Be that one. And now, now upon hearing that, now the congregation can join me. When I was glad when they said unto me, come let us go and tell that. I was glad when they said unto me, come into the deep. Amen. Amen.
even in the undercurrent times. May the love of God surround you, the peace of God dwell in you, and the justice of God compel you. Amen.